Hey guys, um, today I want to talk about this exchange between a congressperson from California uh, and the CEO of J.P. Morgan. And the way that the exchange worked was that the congressperson took out sort of a whiteboard, a portable whiteboard of some sort, um, the ones were with the big sort of paper that you, you know, put over over the top to get to the next page, starts doing some calculations, um, all the while being quite condescending uh, about the J.P. Morgan CEO's annual salary, which was about $31 million. I don't know if, if it was the full compensation. A lot of CEOs get paid in, in stock, um, and their compensation varies based on when they cash out the stock options um, or the stock grants, the so restricted stock options. Um, and essentially, her, the point of the congressperson was that, you know, if, if, I, if a single mother works at your bank as a teller for $16.50 in the city of Irvine, California, uh, the congressperson is from California, uh, she was able to do sort of show, you know, on her paper that ultimately there's a shortfall um, of about $352, about $400. And she's quite proud of herself. Uh, she keeps asking the CEO, well, you know, you make this much money, you work for a bank, you must be good at math. So explain this to me, this gap to me. And, and one of the examples, by the way, was, was a Cricket cell phone plan. And I've never heard of Cricket, but apparently it's about $40 a month. Um, and right away, you see some problems because, you know, I didn't have a smartphone until much later, but let's assume that you need a smartphone. Um, you know, if you go under your family plan and you're like number three or four, uh, this would include your in-laws and you know you would your monthly payment would be about twenty dollars or even less so right away we've got some arbitrariness involved but let's set that aside um you know the, the reason that the line of questioning should frighten you is is because it shows you that congress can't really get anything done and furthermore does not understand why prices are the way they are which is another reason why they can't get anything done and you can see the frustration in the CEO, in the, in the banking CEO's words, his only response to this entire line of questioning, once he realized that he wasn't really there to teach anybody anything, uh, he was simply there to you know, give a congressperson a chance at a, a YouTube video to go viral. His response was, I don't know, I'll have to think about it. Um, and very frustrated. And, and this is actually a pretty good guy. Uh, you know, it, it's his bank has, you know, it seems like he's got enough risk management processes in place uh, because, you know, the bank is now one of the largest banks uh, in the world. Now, what is what is problematic about that line of questioning? Let's try to go back and forth. Now, I've tr you know, the, the, in the example, the single mother made about $29,000 a year. Uh, that was, uh, I believe that was, yeah, that was after uh, the uh, deduction for the dependent and essentially after taxes. Um, and you now I've happened in, I've, I've traveled around the world for about $15,000 and in some cases even less, and, and think one time I even did it for less than that. Uh, and what, and of course, you know, there's different ways of living. I wouldn't be able to do that with a child, small child, because I mean, I, I, in Hong Kong, I would open, I would live, I would literally sleep in a closet. There would just be people that were very enterprising. Um, and when you book an app on an app, uh, you, and you, if you just get the cheapest one and you've, and you've selected, you know, one adult, um, you know, a lot of small hotels that are, you know, that will, will actually just convert a closet and just put a bed in there. And then that will be that, you know, um, the bed that you give to anyone who books as a single person, uh, from a third party app. I didn't have a problem with it and I don't, I don't mind, I don't stay in that hotel room that much. So the fact that I can't open the door all the way is not a big deal to me. You know, the door will hit a chair of some sort. Um. And, you know, it, 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 so number one, here's, here's the issue, you know, prices, the fact, you know, the salary and the prices, why, the real question is, why is the cost of living uh, so expensive in some places like Irvine and not in other places? And Hong Kong is quite expensive, so that's not a good example, but we can say Indonesia, and which is, which is much less expensive than Hong Kong as of today in 2020. So one of the reasons in the United States is, of course, to, you know, well, let's take my example. I'm able to benefit from a currency, right? I'm able to use what's called currency arbitrage, which is I use a stronger currency to purchase something, in, you know, from a different place and a different currency. And in doing so, um, you know, I, t I get the advantage of 
a country like Japan, the United States, it used to be Switzerland, not, not so much anymore. Um, really these days you've got the Euro, the Yen, uh, and the US dollar. If you have access to that those, those currencies, um, you're in a very favorable position when it comes to buying things overseas. Um, now, that of course is not always the case. The pound used to be, in, in the UK, used to be very strong when I was growing up, and now it's, it's not strong at all. It's almost um, at, at a one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar. Um, and so you've got a, a situation where I, I never would have imagined that would have been the case. Uh, you know, it, the UK has oil uh, up, up nearby Scotland, uh, so it's not dependent on on oil imports as much as other countries. So you've got a situation where you, you know you don't you can't necessarily predict the future, but you at least know that you know it's a bit unusual for a country that, that actually has so much oil that it exports a lot of it in order to support the strength of the U.S. dollar. In other words, when you ship that U.S. dollar uh, that that oil shipment somewhere else, you get paid in U.S. dollars. Uh, that facilitates the kind of banking structure international banking structure that helps a, a company like JP Morgan get bigger uh, by having a secure transactional uh, infrastructure. Uh, that money comes in, it becomes used as a medium of exchange worldwide, benefiting, in theory, everybody. Um, but of course, more uh, in terms of whoever is the one that, that is getting the trade uh, in the more liquid currency, the one that's more readily available. Um, and, and the reason for that is because if you have debt in your own currency, you can just wipe it out. Uh, so uh, there are social problems with doing that, but um, you know you have to look at when you look at debt, you have to look at what what percentage of the external debt is held in your currency, which you can manipulate uh, through the government bank, which is supposed to be independent, but oftentimes not so, uh, especially not in a recession. Um, and so you want to look at you know the percentage of that external debt that's held in a different currency, especially a stronger currency, uh, which, is, which makes it more difficult to pay off. Um, so why is it that I can travel the world for $15,000 a year and somebody in Irvine, California will have difficulty making ends meet, uh, making $29,000 a year after taxes? And the reason for that, again, one of them is a currency that, that you know, we want to project power. And one of the ways you project power is by having a stable currency, which oftentimes you know, means a strong currency relative to other um, countries' you know, monetary systems, uh, in part because of that financial infrastructure that is, that is facilitated by J.P. Morgan or Wells Fargo and so on. Now, the second reason is actually the most obvious reason, which is, uh, or the primary reason, which is the mortgage tax interest deduction. And this basically means you buy a house and you know, you, the reason you come out ahead in the end, despite being really over leveraged, uh, in other words, you put down a down payment, you get about 10 times as much, um, you know, in, in terms of a loan is because not only is it, is it a secured asset in the sense that, you know, if something, if you don't pay, the bank can go on and seize it and then presumably resell it, thereby recouping most of its losses, um, you know, but you're, you're, you're also in a position where, and I'm trying to think of how to best say this, but you're, you're in a position where the, that congressperson has through her own actions or her predecessor's actions facilitated a, an investment environment or a cost of living that is higher than what it should otherwise be because the tax code, which is something that the legislature in every country deals with and passes laws regarding, incentivizes investments within the real estate property sector and also um, provides individuals with, with a massive tax break in order to facilitate uh, inflation or higher prices uh, within that investment paradigm, um, investment area. And so you can easily understand this by thinking about just, you know, would you take out a, you know, you've got a house that's half a million, you know, these days, let's say you've got, there are many houses that are $700,000. You're taking out what's, what would be presumably a jumbo loan and, you know, as part of that jumbo loan, you know, you have to make a certain amount of income. You have to have, a, you know, probably a, a certain down payment. And once you meet those factors, uh, you're able to get approved for an amount of money that, no, that, that you can only get approved for if you're buying a house. If you try to buy a, or a physical property, a commercial property, you can't get access to that, to that kind of money anywhere else. 
um, you know, if you're an ordinary person. And the reason for that, again, is that tax code, which tries to incentivize people buying homes. And there's a lot of reasons why people think that's a good policy decision. Uh, the reason people think that's a good policy decision is because, in part, you, you know, a lot of the value, um, well, not only is it social, right? You have a home, you care more about your community, and so on. Um, but ultimately, the real value as well is that the banking system has a hard asset, a physical asset that's very valuable, um, that it can then turn around and, and sell to recoup its losses. But in reality, since housing prices typically go up, you know, you've got a situation where the, you have inflation, and which can then be managed by a central bank through interest rates. By that I mean that the, the, if, if housing prices are going up too much, there's too many people are taking out these loans, these jumbo loans, and in doing so, increasing demand for certain houses in certain areas, uh, thereby driving up the cost of those homes. If that happens too much, the, uh, what you know, a, a central bank can do, a government-owned bank uh, can do, is simply make it, make borrowing money more expensive. So, um, you know, a bank might be willing to loan more and, and to more people and also more money if interest rate, if it if it can do so, when it can borrow money from the government at one percent or two percent. Uh, but if you increase those interest rates to something like five percent, six percent, in order for the bank, to, it becomes more difficult for the bank to make a profit. It has to be more careful. So it stops making those loans, right? It stops making as many loans. So you can see how the system is, is somewhat complicated, but not really, because you've got the tax break, which is tied into the interest rates, uh, which is facilitated by um, this, this policy decision that it's good, a good idea to have more homeowner, homeowners and less. Um, and the bank is sort of in the middle of all this. So it's not actually the primary conduit it's in the middle of a policy decision that's made by Congress through the tax code, and then the consumer, or on the other on the other end, and so it's when you're asking someone, if a congressperson is asking a banking CEO about the cost of living, it's frightening because it tells you that the, that you don't even understand the foundation of your own country's economic system, and you know, and the reason for that is that once again. Um, it's cheaper for me to go to another country. Now, why is that? And, and, and stay there. Now, why is that? Uh, part of it is obviously currency, but I'll, you, know, you can say that, well, you know, the houses in the, in the U.S. and Canada cost more because the infra physical infrastructure is better. Now, that's true. If I go to Indonesia and I stay there for a month, um, it's, I'll, I'll probably, depending on where I am, I'll probably have to deal with a uh, power outage for about you know, once a month for about half an hour. Now, um, it, <laughs> Now, if I, if I told you, if I go over to the United States to go to, go to Seattle, a very nice place to live, um, despite the rain, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's probably one of the nicest, it's the safer places to live as well. Um, and you, you look at it in terms of natural disasters. And if I told the people there that, you know, listen, you know, instead of buying a house for $700,000, if you had to go through a blackout once a month for half an hour, uh, you can buy that house for $200,000. Uh, how many would take that deal? I would say at least 80% would take that deal just to do the, to get that discount. So the discount itself, the price arbitrage, just the differences in price, not arbitrage, just the differences in price um, between different countries, cannot be justified only by the physical infrastructure, especially not not now where you have sufficient globalization to where you know I can get a cup of coffee almost anywhere in the world. There's a Starbucks almost anywhere, anywhere in the world. Um, a lot of the thing, and, and there's even Amazon as well, which is expanding, uh, giving you access to a lot of products from all over the world. Uh, so you're not limited simply in, in terms of geography, geographic location. And and so what what, it, what is frustrating is not only the sort of the condescending tone that this congressperson took, um, you know, in saying that you make thirty one million dollars a year, you can you must be good at math, blah blah blah. Explain this to me. Uh, and 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 that just the the, the the resigned attitude of the CEO. Um, you know, that's, that's scary because you have, first of all, you need collaboration because again, the bank is essentially a conduit for government policy. Uh, and if you're not on the same page, you know, you've got a problem right away. But there's another problem that's, that's even worse, which is that nobody wants to actually deal with the fundamental causes of the high cost of living in a, in a city like Irvine, 
because they don't they can't do anything about the mortgage interest tax deduction. Uh, the reason for that is because if you suddenly you've had this policy for a long time and, and if you try to suddenly change it, the next person who buys the house will not be able to, to take out a loan for seven hundred thousand dollars, right? The, the jumbo loan will be more risky for that intermediary, for that bank, uh, you know, absent that tax deduction. So they won't make the loan. You can only buy the house. Suddenly a home that was seven hundred thousand dollars has to be bought in cash. Now you've got a potential problem. You might have to only sell it to foreign owners. Uh, without looking at, at where their money is coming from uh, because it's cash and you can you don't have any risk as a bank in that scenario. Um, there's all kinds of distortions that happen. But fundamentally, that mortgage interest tax deduction can't happen because at, at home, the bank would only make a loan for $400,000 in the absence of a tax-preferred investment vehicle or a tax-preferred policy that's made by the government, by that congressperson. So you can't change that. Uh, it, it would, you know, you've got, suddenly housing values would go down, people's investments would be, you know, people were told, buy a home, it won't go down in value, and so on. Um, and again, it would also distort the policy, right? You want people to buy homes so they're invested in their communities, even though people move quite a bit, quite often these days, even though you can now uh, more easily work remotely. Uh, so that's changing everything, and you can see that the tax code hasn't kept up. But since you can't change the tax code, it's... Essentially, now you, all you can do is put on a show. You have to assign blame. And that's the fundamental problem. That's also why things like immigration uh, don't get fixed. Uh, things like, which there's been bills on this that, that you know keep going back and forth under uh, both Republican and Democratic admi administrations. No one's really been able to get a comprehensive bill that works for everybody, even, the, um, you know, even after several compromises. Um, you know, and again, that's because it's gotten very complicated. Um, you know, and compared to immigration, by the way, the banking scenario we just talked about is relatively simple. You can slowly phase out the mortgage tax deduction over time. Uh, and furthermore, the number of jumbo loans, which is over, I believe it's over half a million dollars in loans. You know, most people don't live in homes that cost over half a million dollars in America. Uh, so uh, if you go to Texas, you know, it's a perfectly nice place. But they have, they have a system where, because they have higher property taxes, they don't have other kinds of taxes, but they essentially limit the rise in inflation in homes by having relatively high high property taxes. Um, and so, you know, you don't have that sort of jump. You don't have the, enough as many jumbo loans. Uh, so you don't have this other scenario where a bank is incentivized to uh, take those loans and then package them into what's, what's called a, CD, a CDS, collateralized debt security. And then, you know, which then, uh, I don't want to get into that one, but you can see that, that now by having jumbo loans, you, you, you essentially have incentivized banks into creating speculative, not speculative, but um, innovative products uh, that at some point, if, if that loan gets pack packaged into another loan, a basket of loans, which then, get which then gets you know, split up into 16 different you know, tranches, uh, you can see that at some point there's enough attenuation for that third or fourth or fifth iteration of that original loan to become speculative and to create a domino effect, which is what led to, um, you know, in part, in part what led to 2008-2009's financial crisis. Uh, that was in part, you know, aided by the banks, including probably JP Morgan or any bank that was doing these sorts of, you know, uh, der derivative type of, of transactions. So you can see that that's an, an easier problem to fix. If you can, you can actually just follow, there's, an, there's already a model, it's Texas. You can change it, you know, you, you have an established model. Immigration, you don't really have an established model. You haven't really had one. You can't compare, you can't do a country by country comparison. Uh, each country is different, uh, sizes and, and so on. So that's a more difficult problem. So we're, we're already in a position where we're dealing with a fairly simple problem that can't be fixed. Um, and so uh, you can also see that in Congress where you, you're not able to fix things like entitlements. Um, the entitlements typically refer to things like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid uh, on the federal level. And if you look at the budget, about 66% of the budget, or about 62 to 66% of the budget, uh, depending on the year, is on automatic pilot. In other words, when that congressperson opens her mouth, she's only able to really change about a third of the spending that comes, that comes in, into her building uh, under her jurisdiction um, and, and her colleagues' jurisdiction every year because most of it is already out the door when it comes in uh, due to pre-existing obligations uh, in other words, automatic payments to people on Medicare, um, or Social Security, and so on, um, Medicare providers, and so on. When you throw in, say, probably 
defense contracts or other long-term contracts over 10, 15 years, uh, you can see how that, that number, you can see how it's quite not, not as difficult to get up to that 66% automatic pilot number. So when, when, when you're in that position where you, don't, where you have a, a, a government that can't really change anything, essentially you know, haranguing somebody who can make changes, um, the banking system can make changes based on the CEO. The quality of the CEO can determine many things, primarily risk management. Um, and what, where do you invest? Do you try to invest in blockchain today? What, what if you're late to the game? Which company do you buy? And so on. These are all things that a government can't really do. It's, it's, it deals too much with collaboration and compromise. And you can see how at some point, you know, if we're in this position, the blame game happens. Now, if you're, and this is where I, where I come in, I say, if you're a minority, this is where you get out. If you're in a position where the corporations are leading the show, there's only so much power that they, they have. In other words, if they're unbalanced, if they're not checked, in some way by a knowledgeable government, what ends up happening is, you know, you can see what's happened in the technology sector. They've actually, you know, would you, right now, Google, Amazon, Apple, um, they can essentially set policy uh, in the technology realm, um, simply because, you know, in some cases, like in the case of Amazon, they're the ones actually hosting the data uh, for the Department of Defense on their, on their infrastructure, on a private sector's infrastructure. Now, this is not, this is not new. Um, I think I explained it in, in, in another video why empires typically, and because empires tend to be global, um, you know, what ends up happening is, you know, why they tend to become, governments tend to become weak um, in those scenarios. Um, the congressperson is, is a local person, right, deals with one district. Even if that congressperson has traveled, it's very unlikely that they're going to have the same kind of daily interaction with the global world um, than someone that's a, the head of the banking CEO. Uh, the head of a bank, a, a large bank, as opposed to a credit union. Now, and by the way, in, in, in J.P. Morgan, I believe, was one of the banks that was receiving, I think I, I might have said this, but what, reparations from Germany in World War II, which fundamentally make it an international bank because you have to have a physical infrastructure to get those payments from overseas. You can see how this becomes something that, you know, this interaction between the private banks and the government bank, the central bank, you can see how that is, you know, even if they are only intermediaries, between government policy and the end user, the citizen, um, you can see how, you know, at some point, if the government can't get things done, that that intermediary um, either gets out of control, uh, starts making too many risky decisions or loans, um, or simply starts dictating policy, um, either by you know, essentially going on a virtual strike, things don't get done, people panic, and then government then responds to the panic. Um, it, it, it's a bit like sort of the uh, the union strategy in some cases, not all cases, uh, where you know a lot of times unions will simply stop working, but, you know, not go on strike, but they'll just simply slow things down uh, in, in order to put pressure on governments to approve, uh, say, a pay increase or some other term uh, within the uh, collective bargaining agreement. Uh, you can see how that would work easily with easily with something like trash collection, uh, which is why, by the way, it gets privatized because. You know, you want to avoid that, and of course, that then weakens the government's ability to 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 um, have jurisdiction or even to have knowledge about what's going on, uh, because it's now become more and more attenuated. Just like that original loan that then gets flintered up um, and fractured and, and then sold off, you can see how at some point uh, there are similar problems until the whole thing becomes you know what people talked about in 2008 2009 which was one you know just mirrors looking at each other that represent the same problem and the you know represent the same problem or the same corruption um, but it doesn't seem that way for things you know because it's all they all look like everyone's sort of you know unable to see that they're the problem uh, because as far as they're concerned they're looking at something new uh, because there are multiple mirrors as opposed to just one <clears throat> and reflecting you know even though they're all reflecting the same thing um, and so, or, or the same thing that's packaged differently, actually, would be a better analogy. So you can see that if you're, if you're going to enter a blame game, what history teaches us is that the minorities always get the blame in the end. Uh, and whether or not it, it, it leads to something like, uh, like a concentr like a camp, a pogrom, um, or, you know, or something worse like a pogrom, there's all, of course there's going to be scales. Um, but the, the minute you're in a position where you have this kind of an, of an exchange, uh, it's it's time it's time to leave. 
Um, and so I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, I, I'm actually not in, in the U.S. right now. I'm, I'm in a different country um, and I'm trying to figure out where to go. And it's, it's disconcerting because, you know, it, like I said, it, 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 these are not the problem that was that we're discussing, the banking CEO, the interaction with the congressperson. That's a simple problem. If you can't fix or at least figure out a line of discussion that helps you resolve a simple problem, then the question, I guess, becomes how much faith do you have in your corporations? And these days, I think people do have a lot of faith in American corporations. Uh, they want to buy a Nike product. Um, they want to get services from J.P. Morgan, although maybe not because, you know, there are a lot of different fees. Uh, um, it's, it's that, here's the problem. J.P. Morgan right now makes so much money doing other things besides you know, consumer deposits and checking accounts that it may, in fact, lose money, um, you know, overall uh, by needing to do things like upgrade the infrastructure that deals with, you know, the programming that deals with that subsection uh, of, the, of the banking system. Um, that you have a teller, right? The, the, one of the reasons we're paid so so little um, is because you can probably do all this online now. You can do it probably just do it by your phone. You can scan your check and just, or you can have a direct deposit. Um, and so you don't actually need the teller. Um, and so JP Morgan, of course, you know, the CEO probably can't sit there and say, well, you know, this, this, this image of a bank that you have is different from what banks have become. And in fact, you know, we believe we might be losing money when somebody, you know, when, when we open a bank in a country where most people don't have $5,000 in savings um, or the majority don't have $5,000 in savings in cash. Um, and so as a result, you know, when we make these transactions, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a profit center for us, which, by the way, explains why Wells Fargo got in trouble a while back um, because they we're trying to increase the number of, of accounts. Uh, in other words, somebody, some consultant somewhere probably realized that this, these consumer deposits, the checking accounts, the saving accounts, the Christmas, you know, um, savings, you know, account, that, that this is just, this isn't making the bank money. How do we make it money? How do we make more money is that you just sort of like multiply it. Just like the mirrors, you kind of multiply and then suddenly it looks like you're making money, but even though you're really not, uh, because at the core, it's still not profitable, even if you multiply it into different things, into different tranches. All this makes sense. And now, if, by the way, a simple thing here would be, uh, well, you know, you have credit unions. And you can just go, if you want to have just a basic, you know, just a basic uh, bank, that's where you want to go. If you want a loan, maybe J.P. Morgan, especially for international transfers. Well, that's why you have a globalized bank, because you, you want to make those transfers uh, easily. Um, uh, you know, you, you want to piggyback off of whatever transactions or transactions are being made from bank to bank in, in different countries. If you want to travel, right, you want a different, you want a J, probably want a J.P. Morgan credit card. Um, you know, because it's got banks in all over the world. There are so many simple ways of fixing these problems that, again, once you get into a blame game on a relatively simple problem, you realize that realistically, given the quality of politicians in the United States right now, that none of this is going to be fixed. Not in my, not in my lifetime. Now, uh, the other problem that I have to consider is, you know, every country goes through ups and downs. Um, sometimes the ups are, are longer than the downs and sometimes vice versa. Uh, so, you know, if I want to invest someplace, my time and my, my savings in, in, in a particular place, how do I know what's going to happen 40, 50 years from now? Uh, the fact of the matter is, if I could live in Seattle, uh, it, it's, you know, there's a good chance, you know, uh, statistically speaking, that the Seattle locations, just overall quality of life, will probably be better than I'd say at least 80% of the world, um, you know, all over the world, um, any place I pick that I can go to realistically uh, with my passport that allows me time to stay and figure out whether I like the place, I like the food, I like the weather and so on. Um, so what do you do at that point? Do you sort of just hope, you, you move someplace and then you hope, well, maybe I hope there's no, no, there's no camp uh, within my lifetime so that if I end up having kids or something, uh, then the kids get to experience that the, not the downside, but the upside um, as we move on through these cycles. Um, you know, how do you deal with all these things? And then, of course, you want to look at the fact that if, you, if, if you're considering, say, uh, kids, well, now they have to grow up in an environment that's, that's socially splintered, which, of course, is a product of all these other splinterings that are going on uh, with the loans being splintered and, and so on. Um, and so you really want to raise a kid in that environment? Are you better off raising that kid, especially now that you can have conversations easily over the phone on video, you can go online. MIT has a lot of their courses online. They're fantastic. They, they not only have, they have videos, they have like actual outlines 
of classes that you can click on and, and see notes, which is amazing. Um, that that's if you're if you're looking to learn something new, you can just try to just search on on, on the MIT website. Um, so all these calculations, you can see that these are bigger problems because they're so that they rely on speculation, and that's what makes it so frustrating um, because you realize that something's wrong, and if you're already in a blame game against the CEO of a, of a fairly well-functioning bank, what chance do you have as a minority uh, without political representation? Um, and, you know, without the chance of political representation because the, the executive has actually reduced the number of, of immigrants that are eligible to come to the United States um, from uh, places that, that, you know, where people look like you and in some cases share similar beliefs. Um, that, that would make it easier for them to understand your perspective. So what do you do at that point?